Good afternoon. My name is Eli Howes. Can you please tell me your full name? Uh, my name is Connor. Now, Connor, in this first part, I'd like to ask you some questions about yourself. Let's talk about where you live. Do you live in a large city or a small town or in the countryside? I live in a large city. I think one of the most densely populated in France. I live in uh, the capital city, Paris. What do you like about living in Paris? Historically, not much, though the city has started to grow on me lately. I think I've become a little bit more connected to the culture and the uh, the joie de vivre that the that the French have. So that you know their their love for food, their love for free time. It's it it has started to grow on me. I've developed a bit of an appreciation for it. And would you like to live in Paris for the rest of your life? Uh, not the rest of my life, but that's not a comment on on Paris per se. It's more. I don't think there's anywhere I particularly want to live. For the rest of my natural life, you know, 50, 60 years, no. But for the foreseeable future, sure, uh, that would be pleasant. And let's move on. Let's talk about websites. What kind of websites do you usually use? The politically correct response would be, I use a lot of search engines for research purposes. And uh, I, I do. I try to read the news each morning. I try to keep up to date with a lot of my, uh, a lot of the companies I invest in. So I use a lot of investing websites. I think those are the two primary ones, as well as language learning sites. What is your favorite website? YouTube, without question. I use it the most. I would say it's actually, it's one of the chief sources of learning and entertainment for me. I, I use I use it for both. Are there any changes about the websites you usually use? I'm sorry, could you repeat that, please? Mm -hmm. Are there any changes about the websites you usually use? So, for example, uh, in the websites that you like to um, visit? Oh, forgive me. Changes? Forgive me. Um, thank you. I understand now. Sorry. I you know there hasn't been a great shift in 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 my my internet consumption habits in the last number of years. I mean, I generally, as I said, I, I generally use the same websites for more or less the same purposes. Though I would say that they have they have certainly expanded. So I, I found alternative ways to to leverage or use these these websites. But the actual websites themselves, it's I don't know the same four or five I use throughout the day. What kind of websites are popular in your country? I would say most, most in, what are they called, internet discussion fora, fora, or individually forum, like Reddit. They're they're quite popular. They're how how would they put they're the the um, the online the online town square, I believe. Mm. So it's a place where people who have uninformed opinions can shout at each other and try to convince each other. All right, let's move on. Let's talk about talent. Do you have a talent or something you are especially good at? Well, I suppose it depends who you ask. I don't want to be... Eli, I, I don't like to talk about myself. As you know, I'm a very timid guy. <laughs> I would say, if, if you ask most people who know me, well, what's a talent Connor has, probably speaking, public speaking, or an ability to communicate ideas with some degree of precision. Mm. Do you think this talent can be useful for your future work? Well, absolutely. I, I don't think it's limited to work. I would say most people are drawn to other people who are able to communicate. I mean, there, there's a reason why we like storytellers. There's a reason why, as a society, we, we pay comedians to talk or we go to public lectures mm. because we like listening to people who can communicate ideas effectively and precisely. Do you think people in your family have this same talent? Yes, I should say. I mean, I'm lucky in that several of my uncles uh, and my aunt, but particularly several of my uncles on my mother's side are very, very, very well educated, far more educated than I am. One of them has two PhDs in, in totally different uh, fields of science. 
and they're all able to expand at length on any really significant topic that you throw at them. Oh, what do you think about X? And they will be able to have a discussion, an intelligent discussion at length with, with complete ease. And it's actually rather impressive. Yes. Right now, Connor, I'm going to give you a topic and I'd like you to talk about it for one to two minutes. Before you talk, you'll have one minute to think about what you're going to say and you can make some notes if you wish. Do you understand? Uh, I do. Thank you. All right. Remember, you have one to two minutes for this, so don't worry if I stop you. I'll tell you when the time is up. Can you start speaking now, please? Uh, certainly. Thank you. So I should preface this by saying I, I really I've mentioned this before I, I am something of a minimalist I don't have a lot of possessions I don't have a lot of the sensibilities other people do for example I don't find traditional art particularly stirring I, mean, I can look at art and feel absolutely nothing except immense amounts of boredom so the last thing I saw that I legitimately felt any sense of aesthetic appreciation for or or we'll call beauty or i thought it was beautiful uh was my empty climbing gym a few days ago i went during um just after lunch period and sorry this is located in the center of paris and i arrived and it as i said it's completely empty and i don't know if you're familiar well i know you are if the people listening are familiar with what a climbing an indoor climbing or bouldering gym looks like but um it actually sort of conforms to the principles of cubism or, or other elements of, of architecture where I mean, you'll have overhanging slabs of, of wall and they, they uh, protrude at acute angles. You'll also have multicolored routes, so lots of different handles, different shapes. It, I mean, it does actually conform to certain principles of, of art that you would find in uh, a, a modern art museum, for example. And like if you took a picture of it and you saw it in a frame in a museum, you go, oh, that's, that's a nice looking uh, photograph and the reason why i think it's beautiful aside from all the the technical principles i just described that it sort of mirrors certain principles that you find in modern architecture uh for me personally it just when i see something like that one it's incredibly rare it's vanishingly rare that you arrive into a place that you like and no one else is there you will be completely unburdened by the input of strangers which, as far as exercise goes, is it's just a, it's so common where you want to work. Oh. Thank you. I'm going to stop you there. You've spoken for two minutes. Um, do you think other people find empty climbing walls as beautiful as we do? I think people who appreciate climbing as, as much as you and I do would understand the feeling. OK, thank you very much. So we've been talking about um, a space that you find beautiful, and I'd like to discuss with you one or two more general questions related to this. Let's consider, first of all, um, beauty more broadly. Uh, so you described a lot of reasons why a climbing wall is beautiful for you. Um, what kind of factors do you think enter into people's minds when they determine whether they think something is beautiful, ugly, revolting, gorgeous? These kind of things. Well, if we were to go back to the, if we were to go down or dig down, I guess, to foundation, it would be cultural values or the things which people in that place at that time have generally decided are attractive, which is why certain features or certain attributes will or will not be attractive depending on where you're standing at any given moment. If you're standing in one country, people above this height are attractive. If you stand in another part of the world, people below this height are more attractive. So there's these variables, they're largely culturally subjective. Mm. And that's one element. And the other would just be what you, your personal preferences might be. Mm. Um, and do you think that um, personal preferences and cultural values uh, intermingle? Or do you think one is more important than the other? Well, I'd say those are two separate questions. Mm -hmm. So in terms of one being of greater value than the other, I would say my, my general view would be I defer to a person's personal preferences. Mm -hmm. So like if, for example, you said you prefer X over Y and you come from a culture where Y is more valued. I, I really don't care. You do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. In terms of the question, do they intermingle? Uh, I would say 
yes. And certainly if you are somebody who has spent a lot of time in other countries, I think it's difficult not to have been influenced to some degree by the environment you're in. It, it's very difficult. Is it, is it, it's not, oh, John, ah, I've forgotten. The, no man is an island. I mean, I realize that's mixing metaphors a little bit, but the idea that you can live completely hermetically sealed for, away from everybody and everything. No, you will be touched by the environment in some way. Right. And I, and I like that you mentioned uh, physical beauty. I'd just like you to um, expand a bit upon, um, upon how physical beauty can change depending on the country, culture, or point in history. Well, I think the least potentially problematic response to that would be to focus on the last one you mentioned, which was uh, history. And if I just if we just speak about physical depictions of art, or sorry, physical depictions of beauty in art, mm. if you look at the the works of, and I am very very much illiterate when it comes to art. I think it's Ruben. Uh, Ruben painted very large, or w women who by today's standards will be considered fat. Uh, again, that's a subjective term, but if you were to contrast R R Ruben's paintings, w from which we get the adjective Rubenesque, uh, to describe people or women of a larger uh, size, if you contrast that and uh, and his depictions of beauty and his art with modern depictions or modern uh, sensibilities of what is beautiful, I mean, they vary wildly. I mean, now being slimmer is considered much more beautiful than being larger, but several hundred years ago, the opposite was true. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's move on. Let's talk a bit about um, creativity. Um, do you think that creativity is something that people are born with, or is it something that um, develops through experiences or influence? I do think, no, no, yeah, no, no, I, I like to think, I like to think that it is largely a product of one's environment, because I don't think, I mean, I, I would say that I'm decently or at least averagely creative, if not in terms of music, at least in terms of thought. But I don't think there's anything unique about my mind that means if I were born in a different country, I would be more or less um, naturally adept at being creative. I think it's a product of uh, my environment, the things I studied, the people I associated with. Uh, and I, but I do think it is, just to expand, sorry, just for a moment, I would say that certain, certain subjects and certain ways of teaching um, will either improve or um, worsen one's ability to actually develop critical thinking mm. or sorry or creative which by many ways is or in many ways is cre uh, critical thinking mm. so what kind of um environment would be conducive to um helping people reach kind of creative potential well so again I'll, we'll just take we'll just speak about We'll take as an example, rather, uh, education. So if you take the Socratic method, where instead of instead of giving you an answer, I might try and elicit or extract from you the answer through a series of questions. So I just use interrogatives. So I, why do you think that? Where did you see that? What? Do, do, how does this affect another element? And you said this earlier. Now, now you have this opinion. How do these uh, align or a conflict and all i'm doing is asking a, a bunch of questions or all you're doing is asking a bunch of questions but the person in response to this is expected to carry this information in their mind and start to see the connections between uh, these ideas and that where you where you're asked to pr to show your work to to show why you think the things that you think and justify the things that you think though it is difficult at first can actually help people think more creatively, at least in terms of ideas. Mm. All right, thank you very much. That is the end of the speaking test. Right, okay. speaking test, as always, another um, 
very sure that's going to be another outstanding band nine. I, I need a six for Cambridge. Yeah. <laughs> well, don't worry, because you've got your band nine, Connor. Um, now, I, I told some of the YouTube members, YouTube subscribers, I told Facebook group members that I was going to chat to you. And I've got a couple of questions because um, a lot of people have watched the other videos that we've made together. They know that you come on to the channel very regularly. And they said, look, these are the questions I, that I would like Eli to ask Connor. So I've got a couple of questions. And the first one was, uh, was kind of broadly speaking about um, speaking tips and and what you can do to to reach higher band schools so obviously you've just done the speaking test so i thought maybe you could reflect a little bit on what you did during this test to kind of um make sure that you were getting a high band school so that that's a question from abad abad arhama zuku i don't know how to pronounce that name but um, thank you, Abad, for the question. And Connor, if you could just talk about some of the tips for your IELTS speaking. Well, I mean, that's first of all, I should I should I should preface my response by saying that that is a it's a it's a, it's a very good question. I mean, there are we could do an hour responding to that. The first thought that occurs to me is. And I'm going to have to try and navigate this in real time because I am just responding now. Is that improving your language skills is better than improving your test taking abilities? Or another way to say that would be every, every, okay, everything you do to improve your English will improve your ability to take an IELTS test. Not everything you do to improve your IELTS test taking abilities will improve your English. So you could become brilliant at taking the test. You could study, oh man, if this comes up, I will crush it. I will do brilliantly if I get this question type and I'm asked this question, getting a nine. Mm -hmm. But then when you get something else, or if you get something else, heaven forbid, then you will be in a lot of trouble because you've improved your ability to take a test, but you haven't improved your actual language skills. Now, the opposite. Inversely, if you improve your language abilities, it's a, or anything, any if you study any subject and you improve your understanding of the subject itself, your ability to take the test has to improve. Mm -hmm. And I, I think a really simple example of this would be, and we, we both have have experienced this. I mean, the, the one of the most common one of the most common uh, task one types in IELTS is like a graph. Describe a graph. You know, this thing's gone up, this thing's gone down. 10 years later, this thing's gone down, this thing's gone up. Contrast these, give us your opinions. And that's one of the most common formats or something like that. Mm. And one of the least common types of, of task one is a process chart. So if you wanted to study for the test and you wanted to be very uh, statistical about it, the most effective efficient way to get better at the test will be to study graphs. Now, have you improved your English ability? No, you have not. You have improved your ability to describe this one thing. Mm -hmm. However, if you walk into the test and you're presented with, here is how coffee is made, and you see a picture of people pulling, uh, putting coffee beans into a bag, and then it's driven to a, and, and you don't know how to describe this because you've never studied this language, then you have nothing to say in this part of the test. Because you've improved your ability to, on average, take the test, but you've not improved your ability to communicate in English. So do you Whereas, think that oh, when, when somebody is preparing for the IELTS test, do you think it should be kind of 90% about improving their communication, their English skills, and 10% exam preparation and understanding the format? Or how do you think that ratio should be divided? I'm, I'm a realist, Eli. I'm a pragmatist and I'm aware that some people just need a score. So I'm not going to say, I'm not, I'm not going to judge anyone who just needs to study the test or needs to take the test for a reason. And they're not overly interested in mastering uh, another language. Fine. I mean, I'm not going to judge that. My attitude is you do whatever you need to do mm -hmm. to 
get the score you need and whatever works for you works for you. But if you're asking me as an educator, what should be your or your priority? What should be your priority when uh, preparing for a language test? My uh, professional and personal opinion would be getting better at the language that you will be tested, not getting better at the language test for reasons and examples I gave. Yes. Um, and I think you, Jia Pan, understands this because they've asked me to ask you, how can we improve our expression and our communication skills in English? Did you say you, Jia Pan? Yes. Oh, um, so that's, again, it's a, quite a broad question. How actually, okay, funnily, funnily enough, I actually got asked this question. I, I taught a rhetoric course, uh, a rhetoric class not long ago, and I was asked a very similar question, almost identical, in fact. It was, how do you get better at debating? Mm -hmm. And they may not seem the same, but the answer actually will be rather similar. So one of the things that I do, or I've, I've done for many, many years, and this is just my personal advice, it may not work for everybody because they don't have, maybe they don't have the patience. What I like to do to sort of improve my ability to A, communicate precisely, and B, think quickly and critically, is I will find um, a debate or an interview that I'm interested in watching. So let's say uh, what we're doing right now, you could, after every question you and I ask, you could pause, and then you answer the question. The person watching will, will answer the question and try to do it as quickly and effectively as possible. And then play and play the video, and then contrast it with the expert, and then reflect: was was your answer better or worse? What was the difference? Was there anything in your answer that the other person lacked? Was there did their answer feature a great idea that you hadn't considered before? And I do that all the time. Like that's legitimately my pastime. I will watch debates or interviews I'm interested in on topics that interest me, and I will take an hour long interview or debate. And it will take me a full day to get through it because I pause and I will out loud. And that's the important detail. You have to say it out loud. So you actually practice uh, the fluency associated with communication, not just writing. I will say my responses out loud and then I will contrast them with the responses that the actual uh, the people in the actual video gave. And then do you do it again afterwards? So, and so do you respond to what the, the person being interviewed says? Yeah. So basically, I okay, so it's almost egotistical, but I imagine that I am the person being interviewed defending an idea. Mm. And then I will, I will, uh, okay, I'm very pretentious. I call it intellectual jousting. Right. So it's sort of like, just uh, you say something, I respond, the thrust and parry of communication. And I will, but the thing is, sorry, the reason why I find this very helpful is if you watch an interview where you know there will be antagonism or there will be, um, hostility or negative feelings between two people. It's a really good way to also practice not becoming agitated or upset when people are trying to upset you with questions or they're trying to get a negative reaction from you because you're training how to respond to these questions. Now, I find that deeply useful. And again, how, how can Connor answer questions quickly? It's because this is what I do in my spare time. I have a job that requires my ability or me being able to do this, but I also, in my spare time, I just enjoy doing it. Mm. And to finally summarize this very, very long-winded answer, I find that that trains an ability to communicate both quickly and precisely because you have a limited time. Imagine this person asked you on live television, why do you think this? Mm. And then I imagine, okay, if I was on live television, how would I respond to this in an intelligent manner how was my answer bad go back and do it again improve which is a skill that's tested especially in part three of the speaking test it is yeah. so so but again but to come back to literally the answer i gave in the last question or the previous question that's improving your language not improving your ability to take the test mm -hmm. so that's a thing i do because i just enjoy debate i enjoy talking and because that's an interest that i have it applies itself naturally in an IELTS test or any other language test. But if I only study for the IELTS test, I'm not developing that skill because why would I? 
right? Okay, and next question, because there's a, quite a few that I'd like to go through. Um, somebody, I, I can't read the writing, unfortunately, it's not in English, um, so I can't tell you the name, but they asked me, please ask Connor uh, how to learn or how to improve in English in an environment where English is not spoken at all in public. So my guess is where English is a second language. Well, I mean, by by definition, you're 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 at a bit of a disadvantage if you sorry if you want to improve English and you're not in an English speaking environment, that's a disadvantage. However, you mean you it, whoever wrote that. I thank you for the question. I presume you're watching this video now, so you are at least you're you're using a website to be exposed to English right now. Mm -hmm. And there are any number. Excuse me. There are a lot of uh, websites where you can meet people who do actually want to practice English mm -hmm. and who do want to speak English. And I mean, you can do that for free. You don't necessarily have to hire a teacher. Now, if some people want to work with a teacher in person or online in order to improve. Sure, but not everyone has the money for that. But I, I return to my previous uh, comment about um, just l learning learning the language or practicing the language even commute just just communicating forcing your mouth to make the sounds associated with english mm. is better than not doing that even if it's not with a teacher it's just with somebody online mm. or again literally just the, forcing your mouth to make the pronunciation is better than not doing that the same way doing even a little bit of exercise is better than doing no exercise mm. great um, and in terms of actually finding a language partner, I'd just like to, for anyone watching this, you can go on to uh, English Pro Tips, IELTS Preparation, uh, the Facebook group, and there's a post um, for people that want to find a language partner. So um, people say what level they have, what level they're aiming for. So for example, this person's band six, they're aiming for band seven. And uh, you can find somebody else that's aiming for the same target score and ideally with similar interests so that you've got yeah, things brilliant. to talk about. Certainly the idea of, of, of communicating with someone at a similar level, that, that, that would be quite helpful mm. in, this, in, in this situation if you're training for an IELTS test, yes. Um, and some people also kind of had a couple of tricky questions, maybe questions that they've... Um, they've seen in their own preparation that they would like to um, hear model answers for. Uh, so maybe we could just touch on some of those, if you don't mind. I mean, it sounds oh, like at all. jumping straight back into the test. No, uh, what will happen is I can ask you the questions. Um, so, so, for example, Surav Saini has a, a bunch of questions, and then um, hopefully they'll be able to watch this video and pick up um, on some of the vocabulary that you use. Sure. So the first question is, uh, Connor, do you love to watch movies? That's like a, that's a part, let's say that's a part one question. Uh, do I like to watch movies? Uh, I do. Um, I'm actually quite a, a fan of horror films. And one of the things, and again, a lot of my answers are, I actually had this conversation recently, but I did, it was actually last night. Where I said that one of the things that I admire most about French culture is they produce fantastic horror films. Mm -hmm. And I have a list of uh, horror films that I'm going to watch next weekend uh, because I'll have a long weekend. There's a, there's a day off. And yes, uh, I do enjoy films, documentaries, and horror films in particular. Mm. Next question How often do you use your mobile phone? I mean, <laughs> Okay, I'm going to presume to understand the in, the implicit meaning there. How often do you use your phone in terms of discretion? Like, how much time do you spend scrolling through social media? Because everyone uses their phone for, for work in some capacity. Mm. So if we remove that from my answer, uh, I don't have social media. So I don't, I don't, I, I deliberately don't. Uh, I don't use Reddit. I certainly don't use Instagram. I deliberately remo like remove Facebook. I have WhatsApp, but again, I know people. I have friends. I have family. I use these things to communicate. But in terms of what I would call, how how often do you do you sit down? You you have nothing to do, and oh, I'm going to scroll through mm. whatever app. Never, literally, never. 
I just I don't because I I I know that it's designed to trap me, and I don't like that feeling. Mm. So I just remove it from my phone. Are you a physically active person, Connor? You tell me, Eli. You tell me. Very active, Connor. Yeah. Um, no, I, I sit do down. Do test. Sit down all day. Sorry? Would you do that in the test, in the IELTS test? Oh, man alive. Now, that would be, I mean, if you were confident, that would be an answer to give it. Yes. <laughs> you tell me, Inspector. Yeah, English pro tips disclaimer. Don't do that. Uh, yeah, we absolutely. do not advise uh, showing your biceps to the examiner in response to are you a physically active person. <laughs> well, I mean, if you if you really don't want to to go study abroad, that's one way to get a bad score for sure. Uh, and so, if you did want to study abroad, what what would you say, Connor? I would very good. I would say, yeah, I certainly try to be, especially okay. So, if I I think most people do some form of physical activity. That they're, they belong to a gym, they have a gym membership. I mean, yeah, I, I in, in terms of what I would call like macro and micro exercise on the macro level, I go to the gym. Uh, we, you and I both climb, so I, I go uh, try to go two or three times a week for very long sessions. In terms of micro, uh, on the micro level, mm -hmm. I try to like walk after each meal for five to ten minutes. I try to go up and down the stairs. I live in a on the fifth floor of a very large building, so I try to if. if if it's raining and I can't go for a walk, I'll walk up and down the stairs a couple of times each day. Mm. I'll try and do I'll try to do squats, you know, just in my house. Uh, on the on the hour every hour, I might do ten squats if it's a day where I'm sitting down a lot because of because of work. So that would be what I would call a micro level exercise. It's not going to the gym, but it's it's injecting a little bit of physical activity into an otherwise sedentary day. Mm. Next question. What are the advantages and disadvantages of being busy? So this might be more of a part three style question. Yeah, that's, that's a part three question. And, and as such, I'm going to give probably a bit of a longer response to that. I mean, it, it really depends on what sort of job you have, or rather, if you like your job. So for example, being, being, mindlessly occupied by a job you despise or you dislike is very different to being very busy and occupied with a job that you enjoy and that is contributing to a larger goal. So if you again, if you like your job and you're producing a thing that benefits the world and you believe in that idea and you work 15 hours a day, that's tiring and horrible. However, I'm sure you can take a lot of satisfaction in that. So that's an advantage. Um, the disadvantages of having a very busy job, as previously defined, might be you absolutely hate your job. It you derive no sense of uh, of accomplishment or satisfaction from it, and it takes a lot of your time. Mm -hmm. So the disadvantage would be in that situation. Yeah, you're 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 kind of wasting your life in a way. Though I understand we all have to do jobs we don't like sometimes, Eli. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right and uh and the last question because we've only really got three minutes so you'll have to just give quite a short answer to this is um learn english with hamid so a, a teacher that i had on on the youtube uh, channel recently wanted to know your advice for for ielts reading particularly ielts academic reading so maybe you could talk about some of the the general tips that you give to your students um, for how to improve their reading skills, and um, and we can also have a discussion about um, tips for for the IELTS reading test as well. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, immediately I'll I'll make it clear, Eli. I do think you're more of an authority on this than I am. I will say that the 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 one of the main tips that I do share, and I don't know. Feel free to correct me if you disagree. But when it comes to the actual reading like the actual uh, reading comprehension in the test and this is true for any reading comprehension that you do it is worth noting the main idea mm. the side, each paragraph as you do it because the general format will be uh, of the questions after the reading will be you know which paragraph is about or where where can you find uh i don't know let's say one paragraph talks about the history of an object and then 
one of the questions might be, when was the object created? Right, well, that will be in the history paragraph. So if you know paragraph one and is about the history because you wrote down and beside it, this paragraph, main idea equals history, second paragraph, main idea equals criticisms, then you at least know very quickly you save yourself that valuable time because you don't have a lot of time. You save yourself valuable time uh, searching through the paper instead of just going straight to the appropriate paragraphs. Yeah, and I'd like to t uh, touch on that because um, valuable time, it seems like they're really the right expression because a lot of students that I speak to really suffer with finishing the test on time and, and also um, having enough time to really look into those tricky questions. Is there anything that you do or practice in your daily life to be a more efficient reader? Well, again, I'm I'm going to give the teaching response, whether or not. Well, because it's it's what I do. So efficient efficient reading is relative to the purpose. So what are you looking for when you read? So, for example, learning the different question types would really help here. So, if you were asked a question like, "In what year? When? How many?" These are scanning questions, meaning you're not re when you go back and you try to read, you're not reading every single word of every single paragraph. You are only look when means time. You're looking for months. You're looking for years. You're looking for dates. How many? You're looking for numbers. Look, you're literally just looking in the page or on the page. Where are the numbers here? And then, OK, what's the context around these numbers? Yes. And so that that's scanning. So understanding the question type actually improves your ability to read efficiently because there's no such thing as reading efficiently without a purpose. Okay. Like if you want to, oh, please, yeah. Yeah, great. I'm just going to stop you there just because we're, we're running out of time. Um, and I'd just like to say a big thank you for coming on. I'm really looking forward to going through this video again, editing, adding a lot of the useful vocabulary that you use in the speaking test. And a big thank you, Connor, for coming on again. No problem. It's always my pleasure. You know that.